Let me talk a little bit about a new creation. This is so important. It's really huge, uh, a new creation. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about that because I feel that, well, I didn't have an opportunity to do, do that in the symposium. I, I didn't want to just take an opportunity, but um, so I just let that slide. Uh, so we want to, I wanted to start out by giving you a, one of my uh, words that I like to use about inculcating. Um, I told you a story about how my daddy would inculcate his words in us, and that, that is, he, if he couldn't do it verbally, he took us into a little room, and he, and he, he inculcated in that room. So, so since I can't do, take you to the back room, uh, I'm just going to keep talking to you. And uh, to, to define it again, it means to implant, to implant something in you by repeated statements or admoni admonitions, warnings. It's to teach persistently and earnestly. You know, like we are inculcating these truths in you. Like uh, uh, sometimes you, you want to uh, inculcate virtues in your children. Uh, it means uh, to cause or to influence someone, uh, to, uh, to cause uh, someone to accept an idea, uh, to influence them to accept an idea or, or a reality or a truth. Uh, you could say that uh, Pastor Don has inculcated in us the need for Jesus Christ. Yeah. You could say that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so I want us to understand that and then walk in it. And why am I saying this? Why is this message important? <clears throat> this message is important because you and I are living in what Paul described as the evil day. It, that, that is, it's not just a 24-hour cycle, but a, a period of time when evil was, uh, would be pervasive everywhere. Now, I did not say it would uh, be prevalent because evil cannot be prevalent where we are. But it can be pervasive. It can be everywhere, seen in every kind of thing. And we have seen today, when I was a young man, I was a news junkie. Anybody ever been a news junkie here than me? I was a news junkie. I, I wanted to know uh, about what was going on in the world. <clears throat> and I made a mistake in my youth. I wanted commentary. I wanted to hear commentary of the news people. Now I say, oh, that was a mistake. I hope God didn't answer that prayer for me. For me. But now I don't want to hear any commentary. <laughs> Why? Why? Because uh, the days are evil, and uh, and and you'll find out a little bit later that lying has become pervasive, not prevalent because it can't be prevalent where we are, but it is pervasive. It, it, and the enemy's desire is to bring to bear upon you his agenda and not God's agenda. But we are a new creation, which means that we are a new type of humanity. We're not people who are doing the best we can with what we got. That's not who Christians are. We have been transformed. Scripture says we've been transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may prove by testing what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Amen. So, who we are has never been on the planet. Now, let me just kind of run through it real quickly. You can't see yourself the same as your unsaved neighbors see themselves. If you do that, then you are living, as it were, beneath your privilege you are living beneath what God saved you for because God didn't save you just by decree. God saved you by birth, by spiritual birth. Amen. So it's not like God said, you're saved, I forgive you. Yeah, he did do those things, but we were born again. So, so if you haven't been born again, you're not saved. If you haven't been born again, you're not a new creation. You're the old thing, you know, maybe dressed up like you're new, but you're still old. It's sort of like somebody putting on new clean clothes and never showered. You know, after a while, you're going to stink. And everybody's going to know that you're not who you say you are. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Now, remember, I want you to keep in your mind that the Lord saved you for a purpose, 
and you and I in the evil day are to be a portrait of Jesus Christ every day. We are to give off, as it were, the fragrance of Christ wherever we are. That's what we're supposed to do. All right? Let's look at 1 Corinthians six seventeen. He tells us that he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So God has joined each one of us to Christ. He calls this, this group, this people group that we are, he calls us the body of Christ. That's huge. The body of Christ. And so he says, so Paul tells us, as he told the Corinthians, he tells us, he says, he who is joined to the Lord, we have been joined to the Lord by the Spirit of God, and now he, the, by, the Bible says that we are now one spirit with Christ. Amen. You know, that's when you need to know a word like inextricable. Yes. You can't be extricated, can't be removed from. You are inextricably joined to, to Christ. So you are also irreversibly joined to Christ. That means there's no, nothing in heaven, earth, or under the earth that can remove you from Christ. Amen. Once you have been joined to him, you are ir irreversibly one spirit. Now listen, Paul tells us very, 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 very strongly, you know, emphatically, he says, he who is joined to the Lord, she who is joined to the Lord, is one spirit with him. Now, if, if you could somehow be amputated, removed from that, and then go to hell, that means that Christ's spirit would be in hell suffering. That's just how real it is. I know I, I want to be stark with you because I want you to walk out of here knowing that a new creation is not just an edict spoken. It's a reality given and experienced. Well, I thought I'd get a better amen than that. So, verse 14 says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this is, we're going to start with verse 14. It says, for the love of Christ compels us. So, the, the, the love of Christ is doing something for you that you cannot do for yourself. The love of Christ compels us. It says, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And so, it's... Death is a big deal for the Christian because if, if this were not true, we're still in our sins. Yes. We're still in our sins. But our salvation came through his death, through his death. God placed us in him. Uh, I'm going to try to make this simple in a moment. So he says that if one died, that means Jesus, or better, since one died, died for all. Christ died for everybody. I know uh, we have some doctrinal disputes, you know, around. I mean, that's okay that brothers and sisters can kind of fight a little bit, but we're not going to try to kill each other. You know, we, we're gonna, we're gonna, we may fight a little bit. Some believe that, that Jesus did not die for everybody, he just only died for his. I don't believe that. Because, but anyway, we won't we'll deal with that another time. So, he, he says he died for everybody, but then, now listen, some of these are qualified and some of these are unqualified. So he died for everybody. It's an unqualified all. Uh, um, and he says that since he did that, then all died. So what happened is that Jesus Christ, those of us who have faith, we are now, we are dead to what we were. We're dead to what we were, but we are now this new creation, this new creation. So Paul, somebody said, I don't remember who said this, says Christ's love which converted the Apostle Paul, now compelled him forward. You know, so the, the, it's like the, the, the faith that saved you keeps you. So if the faith that saved you hasn't changed you, it hasn't done anything. So it hasn't saved you. So you are a new creation through, through faith in Jesus. And so the, the same love that, that Christ gave toward Paul showed him mercy compel him forward. Look at verse 15. Verse 15 says, and he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves. I've seen a lot of Christians who live for themselves, right? They live for themselves. That's not any of you, right? Not any of you, right? But they live for themselves. The new creation does not live for itself. 
or himself, the new creature. It says, but for him who died for them and rose again. So that means that when God saved you, you died to the sphere of sin. I told you Paul says that Jesus died to sin once for all. And I used to have an issue with that. I mean, I knew it was in the Bible. I knew it was, was it had to be right, but I was still having a problem with Paul. And I thought, what do you mean he died to sin? And Jesus said, remember, see, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I talk to the Scriptures when I'm, I'm, I'm reading. And so one day the Lord showed me that Jesus died from this sin sphere. He died from it. When he came, he came into a world of sin. He was the only sinless person in the world of sin. And so he died to it. He died to it. So Jesus now lives in the, if I would say, the, the sphere of the Spirit or the God sphere. And what he did was he took everybody from the world of sin who has faith in him into the God sphere. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So he says those who now live, that's you, the Christians, should live no longer for themselves. So don't ever live a selfish life. Now, I know you're not going to raise your hand. I don't want you to. But how many of you are selfish? Don't raise your hand. How many? Oh, somebody already raised that hand. That's okay. You got free. I won't look at you, but you got free, right? You got free. So I'm, I'm still a bit selfish. So, you know, sometimes we're selfish because we don't know that your job is not to live for yourself any longer, but for the one who died for you and rose again. So you must wake up every day uh, looking at God's agenda. I told you a number of years ago, I was, I, I was saying to, to Christians as I would preach or teach, I'd say, I don't have an agenda. I don't have an agenda. And the Lord said to me one day, don't say that. He said, you do have an agenda, but it's not a personal one. Amen. Right. Amen. So I have God's agenda. We should live for him, Amen. live for Jesus Christ. Yes. Um, Paul says in Romans 6, 11, he says, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. So you need to reckon. That means put it on the books. So for example, uh, you can do this spiritually. You can say, okay, God, this is what God said about me. So I reckon, I put it on the books. I credit myself um, dead to sin. Why? Based on what Jesus did. Based on what Jesus did. Most Christians don't know what Jesus did. They are still going to church trying to do the best they can, but they don't know what Jesus did. Jesus took you out from the sphere, the realm, the influence, the power, the domination of sin. As he did that. Somebody might say, well, I still sin sometime, Pastor. Yeah, maybe sometime, but not all the time. Somebody said, I do it every day. Well, we got to check your credentials. <laughs> Shouldn't be sinning every day. Yeah, the possibility is there, but not every day. You see, a little baby, I remember when our children were small and uh, they, were, they were going to walk. I, I made some statements about that in the first service. I hope one of our children was not listening. But, but I was, I, they were just walking. I remember when our daughter was walking and walking and, and talking at the same time. It was unbelievable. Walking and talking. And, uh, but, but they would kind of, she would fall a little bit over and get up, straighten up, walk, fall a little bit, get up, walk. And that was her life because she was a baby, a little baby. But then she grew and she didn't walk and stumble and fall in. She, you two, at one time was trying to walk naturally, but you would fall and get up and fall and get up and fall and get up. Well, right now, it ought to be occasional. I mean, come on, sometimes, sometimes in my house, I'll, I'll get up too quickly, bump into something, and I don't fall like I used to. I used to would fall, bounce, and get up real quickly. But now I've fallen, and I said, man, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? But it's not all the time. It's occasionally. If you're, if you're an adult and you're falling all the time, uh-oh, yeah. we got a problem. Yeah. We need to see the doctor. Yeah. And if you're a Christian and you're falling all the time, you need to see the Scripture. You need to see Jesus. Yeah. He's the great physician. Yeah. yeah, but I was going to tell you a story about our son. He, he was a little guy. Uh, I, I think he was less than six months. I know he was less than six months. And... Uh, and uh, we had him in, my, my wife and I were in the living room uh, sitting on the floor. Uh, we, we, we told everybody we liked sitting on the floor because we didn't have enough furniture. <laughs> and, and so we were sitting on the floor, you know, playing a little card game that we enjoyed. And, 
And uh, we heard boom. And we looked at each other. I was frozen. And I was frozen. I thought, oh, my goodness. My goodness. And I ran, uh, and I ran toward the, the bedroom where our son was in, the, in his crib. And that rascal met me down the hall. <laughs> crawling. 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 We couldn't put him in the crib any longer because he would get out. He'd climb out. We went in there many times with his leg over the rail and climbing out. Yeah, a little, little bitty boy. But, but look, yeah, and so I'm saying, but he didn't even learn to walk. He was learned to walk, and he would fall a little bit, roll, tumble, get up, and, and, and walk, and then start running. Start running, even as a child. So what I'm saying is, when you and I aren't doing what the Scripture says, then that's a problem. We're not showing that we're the new creation. Here he says, um, in uh, Hebrews 2.9, he says, but we see Jesus, uh, that's Hebrews 2, 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. Why? For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So Jesus has, has experienced your death and, and so that you wouldn't have to. Because if you had experienced that, you wouldn't have been able to get out of it. But Jesus broke it. I think Brother John, I always give him credit for this just in case he was wrong with the numbers. He said 117 billion people have lived on this planet since its beginning. It's guesstimated, 117 billion. And only one of them was righteous. On, only one. If you, believe, if you believe anything other than that, then you don't understand your salvation. Your salvation cannot be undone. Uh, and I take some heat for that. Uh, not this heat. <laughs> but I take heat for that. But it's the truth. Now let's look at verse 16. So Paul, after saying um, that we should live no longer for ourselves, but for Christ who died for us and rose again, he says, therefore from now on, he talks about us having died to what we were. And he says, therefore from now on, that means from this moment, forward. We regard no one according to the flesh. That is, to, as a natural person. We don't look at Christians as though you're just some natural entity and that, that's all you are. He said, no. We regard no one according to the flesh. And this is what he's warning people about in his day because there were still people alive who had seen uh, Jesus uh, uh, in the flesh. They had seen uh, Mary's baby, as it were. They had seen uh, uh, the Jesus who walked the earth. And he says, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, even if we saw Jesus, Peter, you too, James, John, all of you, Matthew, you, he said, we don't regard him in that way any longer. He says, we know him thus no longer. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus or in that way no longer. So I'm asking that you, as believers of the and the new creation, a part of the new creation, that you would not regard Jesus according to his an earthly ancestry. You would not regard him as, as, as Mary's little boy. And this is what Paul says in verse 17. He talks about who we are. He says, therefore, if anyone, this is the second one, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So what he says is, if anyone is in Christ, he is of a new kind, or he is a new humanity. He is not what the old was. We keep saying, oh, but, but I still hurt. I hurt. Well, that, that's just your body. Your reality is beyond the body. You are, you are a new person in that, in that you are now spirit. How do I say that? Because the Bible, Jesus says to Nicodemus, he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Not a spirit, but is spirit. So then you are now spirit. Not a spirit. You are now spirit. Why? Because you were born of the spirit. 
Jesus told Nicodemus, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven if you're not born again. You have to be spirit to see spirit. You and I are spirit, so we can see into the realm of the spirit. And there are a lot of Christians don't know this, and so they don't live like it. They're still living, as it were, in their ignorance. Now, listen, he says, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, of course. So, so then, you cannot see the kingdom. So that is what we're saying today. You can't understand it. That's what that means. You cannot see. You cannot understand it. Why? Because you're not born of the Spirit. And then he tells us something even more graphic. He says, you can't even enter the kingdom if you're not born again. So then those of, yeah, amen. And those of us who are born again are now sons of God. That's what the new creation is, a son of God. You know, now I know some of us are, out, are walking out of alignment, out of alignment. And what does that mean? What that means is, you know, if you're as old as I am, you've driven a car out of alignment. You know, you've driven a car. Some of you are younger than me and you've driven one out of alignment. I remember this old car we had. It always wanted to go off the road. You know, we're always pulling it, pulling the steering wheel. So... When you don't know what God has done for you, you're like a car out of alignment. You're always going off-road. But when you know, it's like getting your alignment fixed. The Bible says you are now unprecedented, which means that there is nothing that preceded you on this planet. I want you to get this really deeply. I want you to get it so deeply. It will govern your behavior. It will govern your faith. It will govern your walk. It will cause you to know and believe things that you have had difficulty knowing and believing because you feel like, well, I just can't help myself. But then you'll realize when you know you're a new creation, the helper lives inside you. The Holy Spirit is the helper. You know, it's like, it's like having your own personal AAA. You don't have to wait for them to come from Dallas, Fort Worth, or Houston. Amen. You know, you break down AAA and say, I'm right here. Yeah. Be quiet because he's the Holy Spirit. It's like AAA, the paraclete, the paraclete. Okay, so also this new means you're novel. You know, not unprecedented, uncommon. You're not just like everybody else. And I like this one, unheard of. That's who we are. For if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Amen. Old things have passed away. It means like they're dead to you. So, so let, let's look at another example here. Uh, uh, another example is that if somebody's dead in a casket, you know, they're not coming back. You know, I mean, no, we have, we have exceptions to that. We have Lazarus and a few others, but they're not coming back unless Jesus grants a, a special dispensation. So you can say, oh, I miss you. Come back, come back. They're gone, man. It's, they wouldn't come back if they could. You know, uh, Lazarus did it for the glory of God. Of course, he did it because Jesus said, come out, Lazarus, come out. The old preachers used to say when I was a boy, they said he called his by, him by name because if he had said, come out, the whole grave would have emptied. I believe that. No, I believe that. So you and I are, are a new creation. Let me, let me sort of, oh, I got a lot of time on my clock, but I'm not going to take it off. Let me get a little drink of water. All right. Jesus overcame the old. The believer in Christ now has a new relationship. What is his relationship? He is in Christ. He is in Christ. Ephesians 5, verses 30 and 32, 2 through 32, talk about this. Paul talks about this in a beautiful way. He uses marriage. But this is what he says in verse 30. We, for we are members of his body. Wow. So the only way we can be members of his body is if we have been born of the Spirit. Why? Because he has a spiritual body. We are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife. 
and they too shall become one flesh, shall be one flesh. Now, so when Paul says that he shows the imagery, uh, he gives the imagery of a f- husband and a wife together. He says, for this reason, a man, a man, uh, shall a man leave his father and his mother. And he shows us basically the picture of Jesus Christ leaving glory, leaving heaven to come down to be joined. He came down to be joined. I, I like to say Jesus fell in love with an ugly girl. Yeah, we, we're some ugly folks. Yeah, we, we're not so beautiful. You know, we got our, our nasty ways. But he fell in love with us. And, and, he, and, and, and he became, he was rich, but he became poor. That is, he took on humanity. He t- became poor. I mean, when we were terrible, filthy, unclean. You know, we didn't have the, the solution to wash ourselves properly. You can imagine what that smelled like. But he loved us. And listen to the imagery. It says, he came, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So he's showing us, if I may use these words, of our one flesh relationship with God through Jesus. That's big. That's what the new creation is about. We have a one flesh relationship. And, 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 and it says, and those whom God has joined together, I always say this in my marrying people, let no man put asunder. So, so, so divorce is... If you've divorced, it's not a, a dig at you. It's not a slap at you. It's okay. We're going to be all right. All right? We're going to be all right. There's forgiveness there. But he hates it. God hates it because of its, the violence it does. It's an unfair picture of, of it. But if you have, you just say, hey, you know, I did that. But the picture is, is eternal union with God. That's okay. You say, well, well no, no, you're fine. Now, look, look at this, because you're repentant. He said, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And so, this is what God has done through Christ. God has irreversibly joined us to his Son, Amen. spirit to spirit. Amen. And there will never be a putting away. Amen. There will never, can never be, because you are now joined to by the Spirit, not just joined to, like, maybe found a, a, a part that you could transplant and sow it in. No, you're joined by the Spirit of God. So, what does that mean? You've been born of the Spirit, and you have been joined by the Spirit, or with, with the Spirit, you've been joined to Jesus Christ. So, there's no way in the world that he is going to ever remove you from himself. He says, when I talk about this one flesh relationship, I'm talking about Christ and the church. Amen. 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 I want to read this, and I'll read it. I won't, I'll try not to elaborate at all. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. He says, And I, brethren, when I came, you did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's our power. I said, I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So God has made you a new creation. God has made you a new creation. Now, God has done something in you as well. So let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. 8 through 10. He says, therefore, verse 8, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share or partake with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to works, listen, but according to his own purpose and grace. And so the purpose of God and the unmerited favor of God is where all of this comes from, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So what you are experiencing was given to you before creation. 
I, I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say, that creation, every created thing, the devil and all of his minions, all created things are subject to those who are in Christ. No, they can't snatch you from the hand of Jesus Christ. You are a new kind of man. Listen, you are God men, God women, because of the spirit of God in you. You look like everybody else, but you're not like everybody else. When Jesus walked the earth, he looked like an ordinary person, but he was not an ordinary person. He was the Son of God, born of the Spirit of God into flesh. Yeah. He, John tells us in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, was Jesus, and the Word was with God. Yeah, Jesus was with Yahweh, and the Word was God. Jesus was God. All things were made through him. All things were made by him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life. And his life was the light of men. And the light which is in you too shines in the darkness. And the darkness cannot overcome it. Hallelujah, somebody. That's who you are. You are... You are God's sons and God's daughters in the name of Jesus. He says this was in Christ Jesus. This was given to you in Christ Jesus before time began. I want you to grasp this. I want you to grasp it. I want you to grasp it. I want you to get it before you leave out of here today. You are born of the Spirit. This is not an intellectual exercise. This is a spiritual uh, exercise. This is a work of the Spirit of God. You and I were not born of ourselves. I never said to my mom and dad before I was born, but I want to be born. But I was born by my mom and my dad. It was their decision. And it was God's decision to bring you forth. And you have been brought forth in the likeness of God. And I want you to get that because the days that come, you're going to have to know that. You're going to have to know that you know that you know that you're children of God. You're going to have to know that you know that you are above all the created things. You want to know that how? Because you're in Christ. Somebody, you, I want you to get it, somebody. What God the Father has purposed for you before time was revealed through Jesus Christ in time. Yes. And there's nothing that can abolish it. This is what the Bible says. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share, partake with me in the sufferings of for the gospel according to the power of God who saved us, who has saved us, who has saved us, past tense. If you can go to hell after you've been saved, you haven't been saved, right? Amen. It's not a possibility. And called us with a holy calling, not according to works. And so it doesn't come from your works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now listen what Jesus did. For every one of you who is a believer, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So what God the Father purposed for us before time was revealed, or before time was now revealed, in time and space through Jesus abolished. He has abolished death so he's rendered it idle. He has unemployed it. It's inactive. It's inoperative. It has no further efficiency. It's, de it's de been deprived of its force. It's been deprived of its influence. Its power. And so Jesus put an end to death for you. He annulled it for you. Let's walk this thing out, everybody. Let's walk it out, everybody. I want to thank you so much for your time. And we're going to sing this. Go ahead and sing that.
Thank you, Jesus. Let's go ahead. 